Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. <clears throat> I am Brahim Audi. Immigration, nationalism, and globalization. This is the topic for tonight. And we have uh, three guests to help us discuss uh, the topic. Pensri Ho, Assistant Professor of Ethnic Studies. Nandita Sharma, Assistant Professor of Ethnic Studies and Sociology. And Dean Aligado, Department Chair of Ethnic Studies Department, all at the UH Manoa. Welcome to you all. Um, it is interesting that this uh, topic on immigration is, uh, you know, timely one. And the one wonders why is it uh, that, uh, you know, now uh, everyone in the United States uh, on the news, uh, in, the, in Congress, uh, the President, uh, the White House and so on, all are discussing this topic of immigration. And, um, you know, I just want to uh, say something about what Bush says. Why do they hate us, right? But now uh, we say, like, why do they love us? They want to all to come here, so to speak, yeah? So w what is it that uh, creates this kind of uh, attraction to the United States uh, from people, say, uh, south of the border, you know, in Mexico and in other uh, Latin American countries, Central American countries? And why is it that, uh, you know, the U.S., uh, a lot of people are up in arms uh, in terms of uh, the immigrants and, you know, there's this kind of uh, animosity towards immigration and so forth. Uh, so, uh, Nandita, would you like to uh, say uh, why might that be the case? Well, the main reason why there is such a large flow of people into the United States is because of the worldwide disparities in both prosperity and in peace. Um, the, fa the simple fact is, is that we're currently in the midst of an unprecedented crisis of people's displacement. Um, more and more people are losing their livelihoods um, than, than in um, any other uh, time in human history. And as a consequence, we're also in the middle of a massive movement of people. Um, the United Nations estimated that last year there was about 190 million people worldwide crossing international borders in any given year. 190 million people is um, about um, 2 billion people every decade on the move and is also um, the single largest number of people ever on the move in human history. So I think that the kinds of policies that the U.S. government favors around the world, whether it's trade liberalization, whether it's um, increasing militarization um, of, you know, not only itself, but of countries that it supports around the world, dictatorships that it supports around the world, um, the destruction of rural economies, this push to development, which many people have called the third wave of colonization, all of these factors contribute both to this massive displacement of people, their loss of jobs and loss of livelihoods, and consequently their search for new jobs and new livelihoods and new homes. Yeah, that's good. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to uh, also... Uh, uh, play a clip uh, from um, uh, an interview I did with uh, John Okamura, who's the Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies. And I asked him to uh, talk about, uh, you know, the recent uh, immigration laws uh, since like 1965 and so on. So we play that uh, segment and then we can discuss further. Well, 1965 was when the um, U.S. immigration law that allowed for the entry of large numbers of Asians, Latinos, uh, was passed. It provided for family unification and the entry of skilled workers. It replaced the uh, previous 1924 uh, national origins quota system law that severely restricted Asian immigration to the U.S. So uh, it's a result of that 65 immigration law and subsequent laws, uh, for example, that allowed for uh, refugees from Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and also the Hmong to enter the U.S. that have uh, as a result in the, the tremendous increase in the number of immigrants in the U.S. Uh, since uh, 1965. Probably Congress uh, at that time did not imagine that the largest numbers of immigrants would be Asian and Latinos as uh, representing about 80 percent, I believe, of immigrants in, uh, entering the country at present. But I think an, another factor that accounts for large-scale, uh, particularly Latino immigration, is, is transnational capital spreading in the 1970s that has affected the quality of life uh, for people in Latin America and Central America and also various parts of Asia. And that has contributed, I think, to the great desire 
of people to leave their homelands and join their relatives in the United States. Yeah, so, you know, this is uh, like uh, the interview, uh, part of it with uh, John Okamura. So, Pensu, would you like to further comment on that? Um, I'd actually like to address the issue of Latino immigration. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the Latinos coming to the United States have been coming even before 1970s wave. Um, we have to remember the fact that the, um, the U.S. border moved over them. <laughs> and so yeah. they didn't move necessarily to yeah. us um, after the... Um, after the Spanish-American War. And so what we have is that Mexicans were already in what was territorially known as the United States for generations. And then when the U.S. government became when basically California expanded, you know, the U.S. expanded to California and then south to New Mexico and Arizona, it became an issue of, well, where do we, how do we develop the land, right, and make it more agriculturally viable. Um, what's interesting is that as early as the um, early 1900s, you had Mexicans coming as guest workers to work on American agricultural industry before it became the agro industry. Mm -hmm. And this was more formalized in the, in the 1942 to rough, I think, 1964 through the Bracero program, mm -hmm. where hundreds of thousands of Mexicans came to the U.S. legally on visas, temporary work visas, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of people over the mm -hmm. nearly two decades. And so you had that program already. Um, and so they've been here before the 1965 Immigration Act and Naturalization Act. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have, so not only do you have people who've been here for many years, and it's also generational influence, to going, going back and forth on the, on, between the borders. So it's a sense of this is part of the transnational migrant experience that spans at least a century. Right. So um, that paired with transnational capital, plus with increasing mo uh, mobility of people in terms of cheaper transportation costs. It just, it makes it much more yeah. feasible. Uh, the notion that like the Southwest, for instance, uh, uh, is like um, English speaking or something uh, and only English speaking, this is a problem here given, you know, the, uh, the culture and the languages and the people that, uh, you know, occupy that space, right? Uh, so, um, but, uh, you know, Dean, um, as regards, uh, I remember like from uh, the old times, like uh, see, uh, people say, oh, there's a lot of Vietnamese here. <laughs> so, but one would have to ask, okay, well, why, uh, why uh, are they here in the first place? Well, because we, quote unquote, were there, you know, and so now they are here, like talking about, you know, as John was talking about the Hmong and the Vietnamese and so on. So um, uh, in terms of the Filipino experience also, could you comment on that? Uh? Right. Uh, well, as uh, Pensri and Anditas had mentioned, there tends to be um, a, a great deal of disconnect between uh, the realities of what's going on evolving in the global economy and as well as history. The fact that uh, there's a great deal of interconnection between uh, the flow of people and those coming into the U.S. and U.S.-America's relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, it wants to have its cake and eat it too. Well, on the one hand, it wants to uh, uh, liberalize trade agreements, entry of capital and its goods in these places. It, it, it tries to create this notion among the American people that the U.S. nation is a finished product. It's uh, done already and, and all of these other people trying to get in are, are just making a mess of uh, what's going on. So it's, it, it begins to uh, uh, create all kinds of xenophobia uh, and uh, in fact now with uh, post 9-11 and I'm sure you want to uh, bring it to that direction later uh, it, it weds the issue of uh, these uh, fear of immigrants with the war on quote terror mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the Philippines uh, war again uh, at the turn of the uh, 20th century and continuing uh, penetration by U.S. capital uh, into the Philippines and its cultural influence has created created that uh, pipeline for Filipinos to uh, uh, enter the U.S. Yeah. But also, yeah, I mean, but also there's this uh, question of uh, the U.S. wants immigrants, but it is selective in getting those kinds of immigrants. Uh, so, Nandita, you want to speak to that? Well, I think that... Um you know, the facts of U.S. immigration policies right now is that 
The vast majority of people who are migrating to the United States are classified as illegalized populations. And I think we need to be very clear that when the United States government marks someone as an illegal person, that that is a willful policy decision. Um, we need to be very clear that having you know, approximately 12 to 15 million people who are undocumented, i.e. illegal in the United States, is absolutely a part of U.S. immigration policy. It's not just um, despite of you, you know, despite U.S. immigration policy or in, um, you know, um, defiance of U.S. immigration policy. It is U.S. immigration policy. And I think that um, the best way to kind of encapsulate U.S. immigration policy right now is that as far as migrants are concerned, they're best wanted in the United States when they're unwanted. Mm -hmm. um, in this, and when what I mean by that is that when a when millions of people in the country can be classified as a problem for America, as a problem um, for society as a whole, that makes them incredibly vulnerable to the demands of everyone in this country, whether it's the demands of employers who are looking for ever cheaper sources of labor so that they can increase their profit rates. We're at a moment in history where corporate profit rates are at an unprecedented level. Um, they're the highest that they have been since the early 1960s. And in part, that's because the, the wages as well as the benefits and the protections available to workers in this country is declining steeply, and they are no lower than for those people who the government can classify as illegal. So we're living in a time where, on the one hand, the, the government is saying to the populace that, oh, these people are here in defiance of our will. Um, but on the other hand, they've enacted a policy that makes it next to impossible for workers in particular to migrate to the United States legally and for workers to migrate to the United States with permanent residency rights. Um, in fact, you know, the, the key way that people can move to the to United States for work is either as illegalized populations or the contemporary guest worker programs that are in place in the country. So I think that we really need to understand that U.S. immigration policy is about two main things. One is to get a cheap and vulnerable source of labor, and the second is to shore up this idea of the United States as this white nation that has the right to determine who comes and who goes. because. You know, um, as Professor Okamura was talking about earlier, 1965 changed some things. You know, some non-whites were now able to get permanent residency rights where before they were not. But the biggest thing that we need to also recognize post-1965 is that the vast, vast majority of non-white migrants coming to this country are denied any rights and protection, are not given citizenship, um, are made into illegalized populations or temporary guest workers. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that is critical for uh, understanding the question of immigration. But here you have now uh, pitting the immigrant against the quote unquote uh, patriot, uh, which actually is like you know Dean talked about xenophobia and all that. So it's like nationalism versus you know the alien uh, guy. Uh, so um, why uh, is that uh, that people are buying into the notion that uh, you know these guys coming to take our jobs, uh, despite the fact that uh, the experiences with the North uh, American Free Trade Agreement and now with the Central American Free Trade Agreement prove uh, otherwise. In fact, that uh, um, the corporations are uh, really uh, working against the interests of both peoples on both sides of the border. You know, so uh, any more uh, ideas about that, uh, Pensri? Uh, no, that's a really great question, and it's a really complicated issue to resolve because it really gets at several issues. One is, you know, what constitutes nation in the 20th, well, 21st century in the United States, right? It's um, it's about the sense of, you know, who is legitimately known as a, a U.S. citizen. But the thing is, most of the people who've built this nation were not necessarily citizens, right? They could have been um, permanent residents or even illegals. So then um, another issue that your, your question poses too is this issue of well, what are it goes back to the initial question, which was why is it that um, people are using this notion of patriotism, right, as a way to go against this sense of the illegals? And I think it has to do with again post 9 11, the sense of homeland security. And I think it's a conflation of homeland security issues with the sense that illegals are invading 
American way of life. And when in fact they're not necessarily invading our American way of life, but they're providing um, the means for Americans to live their lives um, in such a way that we've become, become common, no, basically we've become um, comfortable with over the last three decades. And so, um, and so again, the conflation with Homeland Security issues about terrorism and about the fact that they're invading our, li our land when in fact we had invited them mm -hmm. unofficially to come. Yeah. Um, I want to go to another segment with uh, John Okamura. And uh, it's an interesting one. It's about like a minute and a half. We'll watch that. If you look at the, this anti-immigrant sentiment, that would uh, begin in the 1990s, especially in, uh, in California with the passage of Proposition 187 that uh, would uh, prevent the children of undocumented immigrants from receiving education, health care, social services benefits, and re required uh, teachers, social workers, health care professionals to report uh, children they believe to be, um, well, students of theirs, for example, or patients they believe to be the children of undocumented aliens. This law was never uh, pa um, implemented, though. It was challenged immediately in the courts and ultimately ruled unconstitutional. So this is well before 9-11, perhaps almost 10 years. So. There, there, there has been this uh, anti-immigrant sentiment and uh, actions taken in the U.S. well before 9-11, but 9-11, I think, increased the extent of, uh, of uh, the politics of immigration across the country. Another way that enters the debate is uh, all the cities, counties, towns, that have made, states that have made English uh, their official language or that have uh, established English-only workplace rules. Uh, these were also anti-immigrant kinds of actions taken um, in, the, in the 90s, and that's a reflection of this perceived threat to American culture by the arrival of these large numbers of immigrants. Yeah, so actually, you know, uh, sentiments, uh, anti-immigrant sentiments has been in, um, in the U.S. for a long time to come, even before what um, uh, John was talking about, as you indicated earlier. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, going back to the conflation of uh, terrorism, anti-terrorist measures with the question of immigration, like invasion and all that, uh, actually, this, uh, this is being used now because it is convenient to be used. So to keep pitting the American worker uh, against the Mexican worker or the worker who comes from south of the border. You know, so I think uh, this is uh, something that uh, we should uh, emphasize uh, quickly. Yeah. So go ahead, Nandita. Well, I think it's really interesting um, to note that um, terrorism has been presented by the you know, U.S. Um, administration as a third world import. Right, that terrorism comes in through the bodies of third world people. Um, and therefore, the border has to be our first line of defense for you know, ensuring national security. And it's interesting if we tie in this hysteria about you know, terrorism being a third world import to all of the other hysterias that happen in US society currently about other third world imports threatening the prosperity and the security of Americans. I think that there's no coincidence that while we're talking about you know outsourcing as a problem for American workers, we're also talking about third world people as the biggest threat to Americans. So I think that you know if we combine the two, what's really interesting is that patriotism is really what's driving capitalist globalization right now. And and you know I would argue probably always has been driving all the phases of capitalist globalization. You know when you make a population, as you've been saying, convinced that the that the capitalists that are in the country are more in line with their interests than the workers who are across the border, um, then of course, you know, um, you know, who benefits is the state um, who can, you know, continue to wage wars and prop up capitalists. And we know that there's a revolving door between Congress and boardrooms of, you know, major corporations. Um, and, you know, so having you know, continuing to have third world people being considered the biggest threats to American prosperity is excellent for, you know, what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. It's great for waging wars and it's great for, you know, securing cheap forms of labor inside the country. 
And I actually want to add to that. It's yeah. Also, it's really important to realize that a lot of this rhetoric of the invasion of third world bodies came about within the last year as people, as especially po politicians who are running for midterm elections this year. You know, this, there's no coincidence mm -hmm. that this is happening. And I think that's part of the reason why you see more and more uh, emphasis by politicians who are running to be reelected or running to be elected um, saying we need to really crack down on immigration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, another thing, like, Dean, I know what you want to get into it, but uh, just uh, to say this about how now uh, labor, especially trade unions, are um, hip to it, so to speak, about the division between um, north and south, literally north and south of the border, and trying to reach out to workers on the other side of the border so that they can, like, uh, educate and get educated and build solidarity and so on. So, but uh, I wanted, uh, you know, you work uh, with labor too, so. Well, well, just going back things, a little yeah. bit, uh, I think the last week of September was a terrible week for workers and peoples in terms of civil rights in that uh, September 29th, 30th, Congress uh, and uh, a lot of civil libertarian uh, uh, among the American people fought it fought hard, but uh, it showed clearly this um, uh, coalition of a lot of the right-wing forces in this country where, uh, on the one hand, the attack on civil rights, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, surrender of uh, a lot of civil libertarians to uh, getting parts of the uh, Patriot Act uh, passed again, including wiretap uh, and and keeping uh, terrorists, you know, uh, uh, in detention halls, uh, de detention centers without uh, w without proper uh, due process. Congress passed the uh, bill to build 700 miles that'll cost billions of dollars to you know so the militarization is there the 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 link between uh the the erosion of uh, rights of immigrants and, and the militarization of the border and on top of that that same week uh funding for the war in iraq you know going on what 20 billion dollars a week or something like that or a month uh all of that are happening uh, being debated in Congress, and, and unfortunately, um, uh, the attacks on, on immigrant communities will will uh, continue. But just getting back to this thing with uh, the threat on uh, Im uh, workers, I mean, it's not it's not immigrant workers who create unemployment, or why jobs leave the uh, go away, or or jobs goes down uh, in terms of wages. That, that's what I meant earlier in terms of the realities of globalization. Uh, a lot of these jobs are leaving the U.S. and those decisions are made by, as was, has been properly pointed out, transnational corporations. Yet, uh, the focus for, for uh, being the scapegoats are, are immigrants. You know? And uh, I guess the American people, the labor movement, have to really address those things. Uh, it's good to uh, see that they have been doing this, and there needs to be more of that. Uh, and it's a long process, but it has to start, and it actually started. Um, but uh, the question, I mean, again, back to NAFTA, you know, North American Free Trade Ag Agreement, uh, it's that uh, it's the corporations who have really been driving jobs away to the south uh, of the border, you know, in Maquiladoras and so on. Uh, you know, these kind of industrial jobs, dirty jobs, uh, polluting jobs, and so on. At the same time, um, you know, uh, let's say uh, corn, corn in Mexico, for instance. You know, because of agribusiness, corn is, uh, you know, corn farmers have been wiped out. So what do they do? Well, they cannot just roll over and play dead. They have to do something to feed their families. And they go where the jobs are, and there is a demand for their labor. And if it's a free market, you know, you either have free market all the way, or don't talk to me about free market in terms of only finance and, uh, you know, industrial stuff and trade, but not labor. If you want to have free markets, you have to have free markets in everything. So why not? This, uh, this labor market migrate to uh, satisfy the demand for, for the jobs uh, that you know, are being sought uh, by employers, etc. 
the, regardless of the fact uh, you know that corporations make money on those workers who come from the south this, uh, those people also who want to feed their families have the right to have a job even in this capitalist system of exploitation etc but that's the way uh, it goes so you know i'm wondering uh, now whether for instance uh, you know uh, the bush administration uh, what are they trying to do as regards to uh, uh, solving this problem because with bush he has a problem with his base now the base wants to like you know probably uh, uh, nuke the people who come <laughs> down uh, you know up up the up the border uh, the, the border yeah and then minute uh, yeah minuteman missiles right there are minutemen on the on the border too anyway but and, and, and supported yeah. by governors Absolutely. and and politicians and, across uh, the sheriffs, board local sheriffs mm -hmm. and, and all that kind of stuff so this is kind of scary going back to the question of militarization but i'm wondering what bush uh, would do in terms of this a new bracero program mm -hmm. is this the solution to satisfy you know the people who migrate up north or is that a solution for uh, satisfy uh, the market, uh, you know, for corporate uh, corporations that uh, are into the globalization drive, you know, transnationals. Um, and uh, how, why is his base really not agreeing with him even on something that is good for capitalism and good for America, so to speak? If you were a patriot, you would do something like that. I mean, in their understanding of patriotism. So, um, anyone wants to speak to that? Yep. Well, it's a really win-win situation yeah. for for employers in the country, whether people come, continue to come as illegalized populations or whether they come in through a guest worker program. It's a win-win situation um, because whether you come in as an um, undocumented person or you come in through the H visa program, the guest worker program in this country, um, you don't have rights um, to unionize, obviously. Um, you don't have um, any protections in regards to minimum wages, labor standards, etc. Um, and you don't have any right to stay in the country. Um, and therefore, you can be picked up and deported at the whim of whoever. You know, whether it's your neighbor who complains to the police, whether it's the cops who pull you over um, because you look, you know, you look like an illegal person. Um, you know, so on and so forth. There were um, a couple of cases like this. They <laughs> oh, yeah. What is someone who's like American born here? <laughs> yeah, it's, anyway. It's a really yeah. win win situation oh. because, you know, it is the classic post Fordist labor force. You know, whether you're a guest worker or an undocumented person, you're incredibly flexible um, because you have to go through the whims of the market. You don't have any options to be outside of the labor market, which I think is probably the most detrimental things to people who are undocumented or guest workers is that you don't have the right to not be a worker. You have to work. You don't have any access to benefits or rights that the citizenry have, for example. Yeah. So, you know, currently what's disturbing is that the Senate in um, the spring of this year was trying to put forward the notion that an expanded guest worker program was a humanitarian option to leaving people as um, undocumented or illegal people. And we have to be very, very concerned about that because the key thing about a guest worker program is that it indentures workers to their employers. And so, you know, surprisingly, as vulnerable as illegalized people are, guest workers in one sense are even more vulnerable because they are legally indentured to their employer. If you're an undocumented person, as, as difficult and as um, horrendous li as life can be for you, you actually have the ability to move. You know, you can leave your job and you are going to be in the same status you were before. You're right. undocumented. But f tying people to their employers through a guest worker program means that your legal status in the country is tied to your employment in the country. And, you know, you either risk becoming an undocumented person or lose the opportunity to keep crossing the border because the interesting thing about making people illegal is that they lose the right to go home. Mm -hmm. they, they lose the right to go back the other way across the border because it's so difficult to try and get back in. So from the point of view of workers, there are some clear benefits to being a guest worker, but from the, you know, but from the point of view of employers, what they like the most is that they're indentured. And 
what we're seeing is that if that's a humanitarian option, indenturing people to their employers is a humanitarian option to you know, making them illegal, then we're in really, really big trouble. Yeah. Because what we're saying then is that there is no hope for the majority of people who come to the United States to ever have permanent residency rights, to ever have the rights of citizens in this country. So de facto, we are entrenching and you know, further institutionalizing a system of apartheid, yeah. where you know, some people have some rights and other people without the proper papers don't. Right. Uh, I wanted to bring this point up because uh, I know a lot of well-meaning people you know, think this is the solution you know, to, uh, to go the uh, Brasero program or the neo Brasero program, etc. But Dean, you wanted to yeah, say something. That, that was actually the game plan for Bush prior to 9-11 uh, as a key to uh, building a base, the, uh, making, uh, expanding their their influence among the growing Latino population. So uh, throwing that as a, an attraction policy. But 9-11 uh, and the continuing failure in Iraq has forced him to abandon that basically and, and he's they've crafted it into uh, using uh, the, the war on terror by 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 uh, criminalizing uh, and detaining immigrants and, and ma making it appear that they're all part of that same group who are able to sneak in all of these people who boarded the the you know the airplanes that crashed into uh, the Twin Tower. Uh, so they, they're creating all of these kinds of uh, fear because um, there's nothing much that he can do now. Uh, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to go uh, to another segment uh, with John Okumura and talking about Bush and his policies and so on. Bush, if you look at his uh, um, policy proposals, he has more uh, in line with what the Democrats have been advocating the past year. For example, um, a guest worker program or a process for undocumented immigrants who have been in the country for a while, who have, been paid ta who have paid taxes, to eventually become U.S. citizens. Uh, but, this, but he's not running for a re-election. And I think much of the um, kind of legislation that came out of Congress this past session has been driven by the November elections and they wanted to come out with some kind of bill that would address the, the concerns of Americans about undocumented immigration and therefore we have this uh, bill for a 700 mile border fence for a 2,000 mile border plus linking uh, undocumented immigration to the global war on terrorism which also deflects attention from the war in Iraq, which is not very uh, going very well for the uh, Bush administration. Yeah, so I mean, this is uh, something uh, important to, to, to say about uh, how the Bush administration is moving along and so on. But uh, I wanted also to say on the previous comments as well that, uh, you know, something like an indentured program, an indentured labor program, uh, is uh, actually a boon to the Mexican capitalist and would stabilize the capitalist state in Mexico and also, uh, you know, economically because all these uh, transmitter, uh, you know, uh, remittances, sorry, um, would, uh, would be good for the economy. I mean, the Philippines, I know, you know, depend a lot on uh, remittances from all over the world, practically, etc. So actually, it's not uh, something that's good for the workers and it's not a humane, uh, at the point uh, you we're making also. Uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, there's another problem here. I mean, I, uh, I listen sometimes to Lou Dobbs and, and so on until I get sick of <laughs> listening to him, you know. And um, the, the, these uh, people, uh, you know, people like uh, Lou Dobbs and so on are very smart about it and they know what they're talking about, basically. So their propaganda is such that they pit the uh, not only the American worker against the uh, immigrant worker, whether documented or undocumented, but also they want to uh, break the lines of the immigrant workers, documented, undocumented, by saying, well, uh, immigrants, uh, you know, are legal and we welcome them, you know, so we are not against them, you know, but we don't want those people who jump over the line, you know, and don't wait their turn as though like waiting your turn is the solution when sometimes you have to wait your turn for I don't know how long and you don't get it. I mean, so any comments on this, Dean or, or Pensry or, or? 
Any, anything you want to add to that? Well, or? I don't think that it's a coincidence that precisely at the period when more and more people are questioning the war um, and occupation of Iraq, and you know, also you know, the complete failure of the Bush administration to do anything about the Taliban in Afghanistan, when more and more people are saying, that, excuse me, what have we been doing with these hundreds of billions of dollars and the you know, um, hundreds of thousands of people who have been killed? Um, what's going on? We don't seem to be any closer to finding Osama bin Laden. We don't seem to be any closer to destroying, you know, fundamentalist Islam, you know, so on and so forth. Like, what is going on? Precisely when people are starting to question the government and, and its policies, along comes this kind of populist bandwagon to say, blame it on the immigrants. You know, and that seems to be, his, you know, a historic response within the United States is that, any time there is any problem in foreign policy, and particularly in the you know waging of war, along comes a scapegoated population from within the United States that can be can be um, blamed, right. and and in creating this kind of patriotism, kind of this fervor of um, American patriotism, um, as signaled you know not only by cities and towns but the U.S. Senate passing an you know English is the official language of the United States bill, right? Um, creating that fervor all of a sudden lends support to the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can once again be sure that, you know, th this is America, this government is representing us, so on and so forth. So I don't think that those two things are a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, on the English one, uh, I remember a uh, long time ago I uh, <coughs> wrote a short piece in a um, uh, Spanish-English newspaper here called Angulos. English only or not only English, a tale of two Americas. And in fact, uh, you know, that's the case uh, because, you know, the question of, uh, for instance, uh, is really this, uh, is this country li really an English speaking country? I mean, from like time immemorial. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, anyone who knows about Native Americans, <laughs> the indigenous population, w would laugh at, uh, you know, this kind of notion, etc. So uh, that uh, has a problem. It's an anti-immigrant thing, anti-other uh, thing, that to have, like, English as the only official language of, uh, you know, uh, of the United States. Here in Hawaii, we are, like, a little bit... Uh, "Quote unquote advanced." We have also like Hawaiian as an official language, which is great because it's an indigenous language, etc. But uh, I want to uh, show some photos uh, from various uh, marches and rallies uh, that happened this year, May 1st, uh, uh, April 10th, I believe, and in July, July 19th, etc. That the immigrants and even uh, you know people who are, you know whites who are um, who know what's really going on and know about nafta and kafta and the rest of it and know about transnational capital uh, didn't buy this uh, uh, division between immigrant uh, worker documented undocumented or between immigrant worker and uh, you know quote unquote american worker you know which means you know white perhaps and so on so i want to show those kind of photos to, see, uh, to show that the solidarity generated by uh, the uh, people opposing those kinds of uh, uh, views uh, and policies bush policies and even the propaganda of the right wing so we'll have it on the elmo just a few of them they speak for themselves in fact um you know this is a huge rally uh, this is in Merced, actually, because what happened in, in Merced was uh, in April, on April 10th of this year. A lot of, uh, in many cities around the, the country, etc., they had, yeah, they had that one, and they arrested 51 people in Merced County and so on. So we can move to the next picture just to show that, uh, you know, how people, uh, you know, let's, let's move to the next picture, yeah. Okay. Uh, basta de violencia, <clears throat> stop the violence against the immigrants and so, and so on. Because, you know, militarizing the border is actually violence against immigrants, yeah? Because you force people to go to coyotes to cross and, and so on. So it creates a lot of, uh, you know, violence there and people die and uh, so on. And they are criminalized as well. Yeah, we move to the next uh, photo, yeah? Okay, this uh, person is uh, wrapped up in the American flag and he is uh, an immigrant. I don't know if he's, uh, you know, documented, undocumented, or even, you know, 
uh, U.S. born for that matter. But uh, the fact of the matter is that people are fighting against those kinds of policies and against this propaganda. And there is a relationship between uh, the trade union, the labor movement, and so on, that are waking, uh, that is waking up to this kind of uh, issue and propaganda and uh, fighting it. Yeah, so we uh, move to the next uh, photo as well, or photos, in fact. Right. So this uh, would give us uh, just some idea, I mean, how widespread uh, the opposition to these uh, transnational capitalist policies. And a lot of people think like, uh, you know, Bush is uh, a nativist, so to speak. In many ways he might be, you know, when he was appealing to his base, but actually he is a representative of transnational capital and glo you know, global capital, that is. You know, much in the same way as Clinton was before him, you know, and uh, both uh, Democrats and Republicans have that kind of uh, understanding and interest that they are serving. So when we talk about U.S. interests, of course, we are talking about not my interest and yours, and you know, but it's about transnational capital interests, and we have to be clear about that. I think. Okay, so thank you for showing uh, the photos. So um, any um, quick comments before we go to something else? Uh, yeah, I think the, those uh, photos showed that uh, that immigrant communities are now beginning are more willing to uh, come out and uh, uh, protest publicly and and work with uh, many other communities including labor uh, and uh, african-american or the black community so uh, and they're they're trying to uh, redefine the issue as being one of human rights, not uh, national security, because that's how, uh, for many, that's how it's being defined today. And and many of those who are uh, uh, who came out in protest are actually children of even undocumented or illegal immigrants who've been here 20, 30 years. So uh, the dangerous thing about some of the uh, the new uh, uh, legislation being proposed is to not just criminalize undocumented immigrants, but to uh, redefine who can become <laughs> U.S. citizens. That children who are born of undocumented immigrants who are born in the U.S. don't necessarily have the right to become American citizens. Yeah, now uh, they are also talking about uh, you know uh, making it um, really tight, tighten the the laws around this thing, which is actually against uh, the Constitution of the United States. I mean, it's, it's uh, rather clear. Uh, so I, I want to go to I yeah, I sure. I think it's um, important for us to see these massive mobilizations against um, uh, the the targeting of immigrants um, as really the beginning of an anti-apartheid struggle in this country. I think we really need to understand that millions of people have been living in this country um, under a completely different legal regime than citizens do. And if, you know, if the definition of apartheid is that, you know, there are two different, at least, you know, two or more different legal regimes for people based on how the government categorizes them, then, you know, the United States is currently you know, has a, a significant um, component of an apartheid system. And these, these uh, rallies that we've seen are people, you know, standing up and saying, forget it, you know, I'm, I'm not going to accept this inferior no human, status. Yeah. No human is illegal. Right. Absolutely, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, good. Uh, because, uh, you know, another, another uh, important thing is that, uh, you know, if you're talking about uh, illegal, Words gonna stop now. Uh, you are illegal. Then she will be illegal for all uh, other, uh, you know, uh, other purposes. And then he'll be illegal because he's supporting, uh, you know, a trade union or a trade union drive to organize the undocumented, for instance. Oh, you are helping them, you know. So it becomes uh, very critical for our civil liberties, etc. But uh, I want to say that uh, uh, rising up and uh, you know standing and get b and be counted. Um, I think the class dimension uh, in society is very important here because it is uniting people uh, along class lines mm -hmm. so that, you know, the white worker who, is, who knows, 
you know, uh, who can figure out what's really going on, is in support of the undocumented, not only the immigrant worker, but the undocumented, etc. So this uh, social awareness begins to increase and so on, and probably uh, develop uh, so much so to uh, look at the class interests of, uh, you know, the worker as a whole, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, race, etc. And, uh, you know, in Hawaii, this happened. I mean, we have a history of Hawaii is replete of all these kinds of things. So we're not talking about pie in the sky, etc. Dean, and, and as Nandita said uh, earlier, by respecting and giving rights to uh, undocumented or illegal immigrants, uh, empowers them so that then they can truly exercise uh, uh, civil liberties, the right to join union, to, to uh, exercise the right to vote, and, and become truly productive uh, members of society. But by keeping them in the shadows and, and criminalizing them, you know, it only leads to uh, exploitation, making them accept lower wages, and all the things that the labor movement is supposed to be trying to fight for. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's critical. And I think, you know, if you want to go for uh, free markets, quote unquote, then you got to go for all kinds of free markets, including the labor market. Otherwise, don't talk to me about free markets, because then they are not free and they're constricted. And uh, anyway, so uh, that's, I wanted to make uh, that really, point again. I think, um, you know, w m many people have talked about how you know, so-called first world countries around the world, and obviously the United States as well, has imposed more and more restrictive immigration policies. You know, we've seen that since the 1980s in the United States. What's happened at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, is an unprecedented increase in human migration. Um, so what's clear is that restrictive immigration policies do not restrict the movement of people. And we need to be very clear on this point is that Border controls are largely ideological. Mm -hmm. They do not stop the movement of people. What they do, what restrictive immigration policies do is restrict the rights of people once they get into the United States. That's mm -hmm. the purpose of restrictive immigration policies. So, you know, it's absolutely essential for workers in the United States to understand very clearly that only by having everyone in the country have equal status is there any hope of kind of, you know, defeating this neoliberal agenda of constantly declining wage rates, constantly declining protections. You know, I was, just in the paper today, you know, unionization is at its lowest rate in the United States since unionization was legal. Um, you know, the benefits that workers have are at their lowest rate. Salaries have um, stopped increasing. So we're living in a time where, you know, this, this massive number of people yeah. without rights is really having an incredible damaging effect on the rest of the population. And it's only by increasing their rights and standards right. that we have any hope. Yeah. Um, and uh, I want to bring another point I think is uh, significant. Uh, I don't know what, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, this notion of America, I mean, NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, so we are all Norte Americanos now, you know, uh, in that sense. So this, uh, the, 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 the politics uh, becomes uh, different. I mean, if you're talking about trade and uh, production, etc., why not labor? We are all North American labor, right? Just like we are all North American uh, traders or uh, producers, etc. So I think this uh, notion begins to, uh, this notion of America, uh, people, immigrants and, uh, and other workers, white workers in the United States, etc. Uh, if they begin to think along those lines, then they find more commonalities for unity, etc. to fight against those kinds of oppressive, repressive measures, whether policies and what have you. Uh, I want to go to uh, another segment uh, from uh, John's uh, interview, and uh, we'll talk uh, after that. Even within the United States, there, there are different sectors of uh, society of different interests, like the, the big growers. They're not interested in closing down um, on doc um, the borders because they're dependent on uh, Latino labor in particular for harvesting their fruits. Uh, I mean, I, I can imagine there could be even more E. coli threats if uh, the numbers of undocumented immigrants are limited because then uh, I think there's already a problem they're facing in California and other uh, states that depend heavily on agriculture that uh, there aren't enough workers because those workers have been attracted to housing where they also comprise a very significant proportion of uh, carpenters or home builders uh, because of the much higher wages being paid and of course the housing boom. 
So this would increase the cost of um, fruits, vegetables that we pay, uh, the cost of, um, of our, the homes or um, service workers in general who comprise such a large proportion, who are comprised by a lot of uh, undocumented immigrants. Yeah. So uh, we have a question or actually a comment from a caller who didn't want to be on the air and didn't leave uh, his or her name. Um, so I'd like uh, your comments on this. Uh, and thank you for uh, this um, comment. In the last several years, the, amo the amount or the number of immigrants uh, coming into the U.S. has been overwhelming. The fact that people have considered translating and singing the national anthem in Spanish attests to this fact. It is an alarming phenomenon. But we have been talking about it in different ways to show that actually, why should it be alarming? Be, you know, I mean, so, Pensri? Right, well, what's interesting is that, the f I think what's more interesting is not so much that it's being translated, but that they're singing the national anthem. Oh. In itself it signifies, why doesn't that in itself signify a sense of nationalism to America mm -hmm. in a way that they can articulate um, that's in their own language. Um, and so the question becomes, how can, is it not possible for people who are not um, naturalized in this country to become American and to feel a sense of commitment and investment in this country um, and not necessarily have to speak English? Mm -hmm. They can still participate, right? Their, their wages can um, be um, taxed as well for social services that can be accessible not only to those who are uh, naturalized or even permanent residents, but also for those who are American born. Um, some of the things that we forget is that um, documented and undocumented immigrants, their lab their, so many of them are also um, taxed for their wages. And that goes into Social Security. It helps to pay for social welfare programs. It helps to pay for um, you know, public transportation systems that everyone, regardless of citizenship status, has access to. And, and they're participating and they're involved. So it's not as though, yes, they are an invisible labor market, but they are actively involved in the American way of life. Mm -hmm. I, th I have a different perspective on that, and to me it is extremely troubling to see um, the American anthem being trotted out as the signifier or, you know, the test to prove that you have a right to be in this country. You know, what was clear throughout the spring as, as you know, the anti-apartheid movement was really growing is that there was a pressure placed on, um, mo you know, um, organizers to wave as many American flags as possible in those marches. And I think that's an extremely troubling um, aspect of what's going on because just at a time when a new identity could actually emerge that isn't based on nationalism, that isn't based on having to um, you know, claim that you're American in order to have any rights or have any say in what goes on, just at a time when we could have, you know, a, an, an identity such as, you know, Norte Americano, like where we could be North Americans or we could be, you know, you know, you know a whole wide array of, of identities that could be formed that counteract this kind of nationalism. Precisely at that moment, we have this counter pressure to impose an American identity on people who may not want an American identity. And I think that unless we really challenge the idea that unless you can um, claim some nationality, some national standing in the place that you live, in the place that you work, in the place that you raise your children, that you're not going to have any rights and that you're not going to be respected, then we're, you know, contributing precisely to what I mentioned earlier, that patriotism and nationalism is driving capitalist globalization. It's not a contradictory phenomenon to have nationalist projects and capitalist globalization processes. They're, they're hand in hand with one another. Convincing people that only Americans should have rights is absolutely you know, central to ensuring that anyone who can be defined as not Americans um, is going to be given an inferior status. And let's say, let's say all the 12 million people in the country right now who are illegalized become legal. Who's the next population? that's going to be classified as un-American, as, you know, non-American that we can yeah, then it abuse. Be based on religion. Yeah, I mean, you know, like it never ends. As long as we base rights and status on nationality, we're going to have this problem. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, a legitimate uh, uh, point, actually. 
and uh, we need to debate this more to come to a particular conclusion and we should probably have like uh, um, in terms of like this um, the strategic outlook might be the one you mentioned but how to move towards it in uh, stages and phases i think uh, it is more a more complicated uh, issue that we need to really um, probably do a whole program on that i think dini wanted to say something. No, i was just going to say that you know among the so called cultural purists you know those are uh, issues <laughs> against America and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah those, are, those are the issues that uh, they're uh, hanging on. And uh, uh, unfortunately, even those who have, uh, who share, as, as was mentioned earlier, similar, similar social, socioeconomic status as many immigrants uh, uh, don't seem to get it, that uh, those are just things that are used to uh, sort of sidetrack the, you know, what the real issues are about. As we said earlier, uh, the attacks on immigrants are being used to to erode the basic rights of all Americans. You know. Yeah, I, again, like the next population might be the next uh, uh, group of people who comes from south of the border, one, or it could be like, you know, along religious lines like Muslim Americans or Arab Americans, you know, the, it's endless, you know. So that's why you have to um, fight a good fight uh, and uh, fight for human rights and civil rights and liberties in this country. I mean, that's the only solution, it seems to me. I want to go back um, uh, to uh, another segment from Okamura and uh, talking about legislation and uh, terrorist threats and so forth. The, the legislation, like the, the um, increasing border patrol agents and uh, the border fence, uh, this is just politics. Uh, to so the Republicans say that we did come up with some kind of solution prior to the November elections, but it's not long-term policy. Uh, if the issue is also one of um, national security, then we've got a much larger, bo longer border with Canada, and it's much more difficult to put up a fence across the Great Lakes area or this heavily forested area across the border. Uh, but no one is raising that as an issue. It's not a question of... Uh, undocumented Canadians entering the U.S., but it's anyone who could enter Canada and then enter the, to the U.S., as has happened, uh, to pose a possible terrorist threat. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, Canadians, <laughs> and it's not only Canadians, anyone could come through this porous border, you, you know. Any comments on this, anyone? Uh? On what uh, John was saying, Dean? Well, it just shows how uh, desperate some uh, politicians are that to, to think that uh, uh, the issue of immigration can be solved by putting up a 700 mile border yeah. you know and as John Okamor said that's really very short-sighted because uh, it doesn't really address you know what the the main points are and then uh, they might start flying with like big kites or you know digging tunnels you know i mean sure. already there are a lot of tunnels yeah about life and death here yeah. this is survival How about right? putting a moat or something you know and fortress america you know i mean it's it's, it's not going to work i mean it's uh, there, yeah been other walls that's yeah. been created you had the uh, hadrian wall yeah hadrian wall <laughs> you had the uh, famous wall in china yeah mm -hmm. you know so this okay. one yeah. It's just as foolish. Sure. So we're uh, flat out of time, actually. And uh, thank you for uh, helping us uh, discuss this. And thanks uh, to our viewers. And uh, we'll see you next month.